Are you looking for an intriguing new book about history that you can read this year? Not the same old, same old, but something that might help you see the world today more clearly. That can help you tell richer stories about the past and not just of your country, but of the whole world and books that are written well so they can be enjoyed by you and not feel like you're back at school with too much facts and too many dull pieces of prose. Well, I have six top history books from 2013 23 that will intrigue and surprise you. And they're not just my personal favourites, they're prize-winning books from the Wolfson History Prize. And they're all six books you might want to add to your list to read over the rest of 2023 and into 2024. I am Jeff Richer and this is the Burning Archive podcast. Do subscribe, to like, do share this video that looks at some of the top books to read that help you understand the world today builds on some other videos that I've done like five top books on geopolitics and history or my interview with the world's leading historian of the world Felipe Fernandez Armesto do check it out in the description below. And why don't you subscribe to the channel? These books are not my personal favourites. They're not my recommendations. They're not just the view of some eccentric YouTuber. They are, are recognised by some of the world's leading historians as readable, enjoyable, scholarly and groundbreaking new history books. That will intrigue and surprise you. The six history books that I'm going to share today have all been shortlisted for the Wolfson History Prize. And looking at prizes like the Nobel Prize or the Wolfson History Prize is a great way to give you some ideas, some prompts, some kickstarts for new ideas for things to read. The Wolfson History Prize uh, is... uh, Britain's most prestigious and lucrative history prize. It began in 1972 and many of the books I've featured on this channel have in fact been winners or uh, nominees for the Wolfson History Prize. You can probably see a stack of them in the shelves there just behind me. The winner receives £50,000 and all the shortlisted books, the six shortlisted books or authors, receive £5,000 as prize money. So it is a valuable prize and it is a real honour and a mark of quality if you see a book that says Wolfson History Prize uh, nominee or winner at your local bookshop. Last year's winner was Claire Jackson's Devil Land, a brilliant history of uh, England's turbulent period between 1518 1588 and 1688, the like the English Civil War and all that sort of thing. Uh, and previous winners have also included John Darwin's After Tamerlan that I've featured on the channel, David Abelufia's Boundless Sea, uh, McDermott's The Reformation, and Catherine Merrydale's Red Fortress. Great, great books enjoyable, readable books. I think you're going to enjoy some of the books and how they're going to surprise and intrigue you from this year's shortlist. And as I go through the list, uh, why don't you take a note of some of those that spark your curiosity and why not leave a comment below uh, for me and I might even do a video on the book that most viewers are interested in. I will certainly do a later video on the winner of the prize, the winners announced in early November. But let me know in a comment below if there is one of these books that so intrigues you, you'd like me to do a review of the book before then. Book number one is Africa and Caribbean People in Britain, a history by Hakim Adi. Now, Hakim Adi shows how African and Caribbean people, men and women, 
have been part of Britain's history for much longer than you think, certainly much longer than the kind of post-World War II migration to Britain. Libyan legionnaires patrolled the walls of Hadrian's, the tops of Hadrian's Wall. Rome's first African emperor died in York in Britain. In Elizabethan England, uh, black Tudors served in the lands uh, in some of the courts uh, and um, wealthy families' uh, uh, palaces and Africans explored the world with Sir Francis Drake. And then, of course, there was this transatlantic slave trade the scramble for Africa and British colonies, and of course the long and ongoing struggle for equality and decolonisation. What is intriguing about this book is how it flips um, settled rigid images of uh, certain peoples and countries. Then people, uh, history doesn't occur fixed in certain maps and periods of time. There is cultural exchange and mutual influence between continents, empires, peoples, civilizations, cultures across. Indeed, you discover that the world has been multipolar and uh, a big, open, diverse place for a very, very long time. Hakim Adi was the first historian of African heritage to become a professor of history in Britain when he was appointed the professor of the history of Africa and the African diaspora at the University of Chichester. Uh, And he held that position from 2015 to 2023. I'm really uh, keen to read this book because exploring Africa's role in global history is a question viewers have asked me on this YouTube channel, and I am really interested and curious about this book. What about you? Book number two, The World the Plague Made, The Black Death and the Rise of Europe by James Bellich or Bellick. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce your name. James, my apologies. James Bellick is a New Zealand historian, but he works in Britain. Who does not like a story about the plague and the Black Death? It's the popular, it's the iconic image of the middle, uh, the end of the Middle Ages, I guess, that you see on YouTube. And I guess the popular image of the Black Death that you see on YouTube, on films, on television is of medieval Western Europe. Um, But the Black Death and the plague of the 14th century uh, was a global phenomenon uh, and it changed societies, governments, cultures all around the world. Uh, The Mongols, Russia, China, Egypt, and of course uh, Europe and its surrounding islands like Britain. It was a terrible catastrophe. Uh, One third to half of the population died, but it also enriched countries uh, and laid the groundwork, this book argues, for Western Europe's dramatic rise to global power. Bellich shows how many more people had higher disposable incomes after the plague. Demand grew for silks, sugars, spices, furs, gold and slaves. And labour scarcity drove more use of water power, wind power and gunpowder. Technologies like water powered blast furnaces, galleons and muskets uh, were kicked along by the plague, but also empires the Mongol Empire, Mongols, uh, empires in the Middle East or West Asia and in Russia uh, flourished after the plague and European expansion uh, was also, and the European experience was also connected to what was happening in China. 
So what's intriguing about this book is, again, it flips a popular image from history that we all carry around in our minds, the image of I guess the Black Death, the plague has been, uh, uh, you know, part, the end of Merry England, the experience of Western Europe, of medieval Western Europe. Uh, This book provides a global, up-to-date and surprising, intriguing story how both good and bad consequences flowed from the plague. Now, James Bellich is the bite Professor, B-E-I-T, Professor of Global and Imperial History at the University of Oxford. And I am really looking forward to this book. It will be interesting, if nothing else, to compare how Europe responded, how the whole world responded to the plague, the Black Death of the 14th century, to our, all of our common experience uh, in the, across, across the world, to the most recent plague that we've had, of course, the coronavirus uh, epidemic uh, or pandemic from 2020. Book number three, The Perils of Interpreting the Extraordinary Lives of Two Translators Between Qing, China and the British Empire by Henrietta Harrison. Now, The Pearls of Interpreting tells the story of the 1793 British embassy to China, which led to a famous failed encounter between the British ambassador and the Chinese Chonglong emperor. I think it might have been the one where the British ambassador refused to uh, kowtow and the Chinese emperor told him to just go away. Henrietta Harrison tells the story through uh, two interpreters, as in language interpreters, who were at that meeting, uh, Lee Zibial and George Thomas Staunton. Uh, They're extraordinary stories. I've heard some of the story of George Thomas Staunton previously in uh, a history written about uh, the Opium Wars in China. So who were these two men? Uh, How did they intervene in the exchanges that they interpreted and mediated and were in a way diplomats and representatives of their two cultures for? What did those exchanges really mean for them? What was it like to be a fly on that wall, that extraordinary wall between the encounter between the great Chinese Empire and the great British Empire. It's a remarkable story of more uh, cultural mutual learning and exchange, much more so than you might expect from the stereotyped image of both Chinese and British people of that time. And it is also a tragic story, or it might be a tragic story. I can imagine it might be a tragic story. We will see when I read it. Uh, Because growing tensions um, between China and British Empire would endanger those who embraced with, identified with, connected with, tried to learn from both cultures, uh, all of this would eventually culminate in the opium wars in the mid and late 19th century in Britain, the opium wars that started China's century of humiliation. This book is intriguing because of its approach. It provides an intimate portrait, not of the great men, but of two people uh, in a way stranded in each other's culture, trying to bridge misunderstandings. It's also an example of a different way of uh, writing history, a kind of a more intimate portrait, Uh, not just the big grand themes, but the interpersonal interactions between people who represent some of those themes as individual characters. Henrietta Harrison is a professor of modern Chinese studies at the University of Oxford and the Stanley Ho Tutorial Fellow in Chinese History at Pembroke College. 
I am really looking forward to reading this book, I've got to say. As an Australian who is dismayed at the hardening uh, misunderstandings and the harsh rhetoric between China and America and between a lot of people in Australia and China, I feel this book is very, very timely and it might help us tell some mindful stories of the past that might just prevent another set of misunderstandings and another disastrous set of wars between China and the Anglo-Americans. Book number four is Vagabond's Life on the Streets of 19th Century London uh, by Oscar Jensen or Jensen. I'm not sure again how to pronounce his name. My apologies, Oscar, if you're watching the video. Now, this is an innovative social history that sheds new light on London's poor, uh, lower classes, working class, uh, vagabonds during, uh, you know, I guess the height of the great London, you know, as the centre of the British Empire between 1780 and 1870. And it's a street level account, I guess, of what it was really like to be poor and, uh, you know, down and out in London in the 19th century. Uh, But were they down and out? We might think that we know this story from Dickens. You might even know it from some of the famous social inquiries of the late 19th century that looked at the condition of the poor like Henry Mayhew. But Jensen's Vagabonds uses brilliant new historical research methods to recover first-hand accounts and testimonies of the street urchins and the urban poor of London in their own words, not encrusted with all the cliches of Cockney accents that we've all seen for, I don't know, 200 years. Uh, He recovers a vibrant, diverse, cosmopolitan world that includes beggars and thieves, musicians and missionaries, uh, porters and hawkers, sex workers and street criers. And what emerges is uh, a diverse story of working classes, diverse in gender, ethnicity, origin, ability and occupation, who respond in a whole diverse set of ways to the challenges uh, they faced. What is intriguing about this book is um, we all know this story, I guess, or we all think we know this story of the urban poor of London from Dickens or Sherlock Holmes or a thousand television stories and films. Oliver, Um, even musicals, there you go. Or even some YouTube videos. Uh, 19th century London is a popular theme on YouTube too. Uh, Cockney, chimney sweeps, all that sort of thing. And again, this is a book that in a surprising, intriguing, but, you know, a high, high quality way uh, flips our images of the stories of the past and images of the past. Oscar Jensen is a fellow of Newcastle University, a new generation thinker, which sounds like a good thing to be, and a former Leverhulme early career fellow. I believe he does a bit of radio and television in Britain and he has uh, his very own website. I am looking forward to looking at this book. I studied this topic myself in a way. Uh, I did social history of the 19th century, of the working classes in uh, a sort of uh, colonial London in Melbourne and Victoria in Australia. But Uh, I will be intrigued about how Jensen recovers the testimony and the actual voices of the people of the street, of the poor, Uh, because I know from my own research that is a really skillful uh, and admirable thing, uh, but a difficult thing to do. It's just hard to find those sources. 
Book number five is Resistance, The Underground War in Europe, 1939 to 1945 by Halik Korchansky. Uh, now, Resistance is a powerful, humane, haunting account of the uh, how people resisted to the Nazi occupation across uh, Europe uh, in World War II, and why people uh, took the brave, courageous, but always difficult decision to resist the Third Reich. It's it, the resistance occurred all across Europe, from occupied Soviet Union to the Netherlands, Norway, Denmark, and of course, the well-known story of the French resistance. And all of these um, resistance movements had their own particular story, their own balance of local initiative and, I guess, um, involvement of the Allied powers, Britain, America, and, and I guess the Soviet Union. Uh, the author Halik Kochansky is a British historian. Uh, she's done a bit of military history and some work on uh, Poland's experience of resistance as well. I recently watched the film Come and See, uh, which some say is the greatest war film ever made. Uh, it's a Soviet war film made about the experience of the partisan resistance uh, to Nazi occupation of Belarus and the Soviet Union during World War II. And it's a profoundly moving film. And I'm looking forward to broadening my understanding of this extraordinary, difficult experience, uh, especially given the often stereotyped images of World War II and World War II resistance that we see in films, and I guess the inherent inspiration and courage of these kind of stories. I'm sure there'll be many wonderful surprises and, of course, some terrible stories, uh, terrible and tragic stories as well. Book number six, and it's our good way to end, is called Portable Magic, A History of Books and Their Readers, Emma Smith. Uh, and as someone who is a reader uh, looking out for history books, how could you not be interested in this book? Portable Magic provides an iconoclastic, magical story of how readers have encountered books over history, over the history of the last thousand years or so. When, why and how did they acquire their portable magic, which is a term taken from the uh, American novelist Stephen King. Uh, this history looks at the last millennium. I'm not sure of its geographical range, but it looks at books big and small, and it looks at both their contents, their stories, but also their physical form. It looks at their bookhood, uh, which gives them their magic. Ultimately, uh, portable magic uh, helps show how the written word is much more uh, a conversation, I guess, between readers and books and writers and not just a one-way traffic. Just like YouTube is a great way to communicate with me, leave us a comment below and don't forget to share and subscribe. Now, Emma Smith is the Professor of Shakespeare Studies at Hertford or Hartford College. Uh, and this will be an intriguing book full of delightful surprises, I'm sure, that looks at the very matter of books in which we spend so much time uh, and the history of this very odd enchantment that has been such a large part of my life, and I'm sure if you're interested in this video about books, I'm sure it's a big part of your life too. I think as a reader interested in the literary traditions of history and books, I will certainly be interested in this book um, and 
Also in how a book from a literary scholar, um, I'm not exactly sure of Emma Smith's particular expertise, but a professor of Shakespeare studies, makes me think she's a literary scholar as much as a, you know, professional academic historian, a traditional historian, uh, and how her perspective sheds a different kind of light on history. And she might even be able to explain why, uh, even though uh, I have got a lot of little books on this Kindle here, or a lot of quite big books on this Kindle here, but I still kind of prefer to read the books uh, behind me that are actually in physical form. What about you? Uh, now, one of these six books uh, will be announced the winner in early November. And I know I am going to get uh, these books from the library or the bookshop, uh, buy them online, uh, and I will do certainly a video of the winner uh, here and also if you leave a comment below about which of these books most intrigues you, I will do a video on that one too, just for you, my YouTube viewers and subscribers. Make sure you like, share and subscribe now. So leave me a comment about which one of these intrigues or surprises you, which one you're looking forward to reading to change your, the way you see the world more clearly with history. And uh, if none of these books uh, intrigued you, I've got a special bonus surprise of another 14 books um, from another history prize, the Kundal History Prize, uh, which is the world's richest history prize from Canada. I'll be doing a video on its shortlist shortly. It's announced in a couple of weeks. Uh, but also do check out my video with Felipe Fernandez Amesto, the world's leading historian of the world, or my video on the top five books on geopolitics and history that features some previous winners of the Wolfson History Prize. And I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks when I'll be talking about the winner of the Wolfson History Prize.